Well, good evening. Um, some of you may still be signing in, but let me get started. My name is Steve Sang. I am the director of the SOAS China Institute. I'm very pleased that today we have an extremely interesting and important subject for discussion, and it will be led by somebody who is probably the world's leading authority on this subject. The subject of the discussion is what's, what is she fighting? The dynamics of corruption in post Mao China. The speaker is Professor Andrew Waitman. Um, Andrew is a professor of politics and the director of the China Studies Program at the Georgia State University in the United States of America. He has worked a, a lot on um, China's corruption issues and he has published already two books, very important books, and he's working on the third one. He's the author of From Miles to Market, Rent Seeking Local Protectionism and Marketization in China. He's also author of Double Paradox, Rapid Growth and Rising Corruption in China. And the project he's working on is analyzing Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign, which is at the moment entitled Hunting Tigers and Swapping Flies, Xi Jinping's Battle with Corruption. And I believe that much of what he's going to be talking to us will be building on his published work and his forthcoming work, this current project. And while he will be speaking obviously a lot on the, in terms of the issues building up to the kind of corruption challenges that Xi Jinping will be facing, I'm sure he would be perfectly happy to engage with you in conversations about more contemporary situations of corruption or counter-corruption in China. Now, before I hand over to Andrew, I realized that from previous experience, some of you will be putting through questions before the end of the presentation. So if you plan to do so, please use the Q&A function. And if you are watching this via uh, the Facebook stream, your questions will be pushed uh, by Archies to me through a different channel. And I will try to make sure that questions being put through both the Facebook stream as well as the Zoom uh, participation participants are being addressed. This meeting is being recorded. So if you are concerned about uh, the recording, um, please bear that in mind. And if you would like to ask a question anonymously, you can do so. But instead of simply not providing your name, uh, please simply say that you would prefer your identity to be kept anonymous. It would be helpful for me to know who you are and also where you are from. It just gave me a bit of um, uh, context to understand where the question comes from. But your identity, if you would like to um, protect it, will definitely, definitely be protected. With that, let me now hand over to um, Professor Waitman. Well, thank you, Dr. Sang, for that kind introduction. I'm not sure I am the world's expert on corruption, um, although my former boss used to call me Mr. Corruption, and I wasn't quite sure that was a, a, a good thing. Um, but thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you to all of the audience joining us this evening. Um, Typically, when people want me to talk about uh, anti-corruption in, uh, in China, and particularly the post-2013 uh, uh, crackdown, 
uh, the first question, of course, is who? And well, the who is, is not all that complicated. Uh, as you can see from my screen, I've lined up the, uh, the big six, uh, Bo Xi Lai, Zhou Yang Kang, Ling Jiwa, uh, Su Tsai He, uh, Guo Bo Xiang, and uh, San Zhang Su. Uh, the five, or six, excuse me, six members of the, uh, the Politburo that have been taken down between uh, 2012, 2017. Of course, as I'll talk about in a moment, they're a tiny fraction of the number of people who have been investigated, indicted, and convicted over the past eight years. Uh, generally, the second question people want to get to, and, uh, and that is, uh, why? What is the campaign all about? Uh, they want to know, is it a uh, an anti-corruption cleanup? Is it a purge? Is it a political purge? Is it a witch hunt? Um, and uh, you know, that's an important question, and I'm, I'm happy to, to entertain it. And my answer is to all three of those questions is yes. It's a combination of all of those. There is certainly a political element to it. It occupies a very tiny corner of the overall anti-corruption crackdown. Um, it's mostly a very at the high level. Uh, but beneath the high level, and I will argue uh, in the course of this talk, that once you get beyond the, high, the headline, once you get beyond the exciting parts of who's doing what to whom and who's a protege of who and, and so forth, uh, there's a much bigger question. And that is the what question. What is Xi Jinping battling? And here, I think we need to start out and in, 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 in focus on what an anti-corruption crackdown involves. Um, the crackdown is actually a response to corruption. Uh, it is a response to the sense, uh, presumably, that corruption has increased and that if the regime doesn't do something about it, uh, corruption will spiral out of control. So when we look at what, what we look at kind of the visible part of an anti-corruption campaign, we're not actually looking at corruption in the genesis, you know, the genesis of corruption. We're looking at the end of corruption. We're not looking at when people begin to be corrupt. We're looking at when they abruptly stop being corrupt because they've been arrested, indicted, and so forth. So that when we look at what's happened between 2013 and uh, this morning, or excuse me, in your case, this, uh, this evening, um, all of that is a response to things that happened earlier. And so what I want to suggest in this talk, and um, I guess it's probably worth saying something about the background of my perpetual in-process book, uh, Hunting Tigers and Swatting Flies. Um, I sort of started out with a kind of narrative, thinking about or thinking that what was important about the anti-corruption campaign was the who and the why. But as I got into it, I realized the major question is the what. And the, the what, what is I'll, is I'll talk about later, um, tigers, the senior people involved in corruption, the gang of six that I have up on this preliminary slide, uh, they didn't start life as tigers. They started life not at the top, but much lower down in the party state apparatus. And they climbed that party state apparatus over a process, in uh, the case of some of them, over several decades. And during those times, many of them were involved in corruption, which to me, and I'll, I'll get into this later in the talk, suggests that what we need to be looking at is not in order to understand what we need to be looking at in order to understand Xi Jinping's anti-corruption crackdown of 2013, 2012, is we, we need to be looking at a period much earlier than this, which is when the corruption he is fighting today actually began to take off. So let me begin, I'll run through and, um, uh, highlight some of the things about the the, can, the crackdown itself. Um, one thing, I, I don't know if you notice, I use the term crackdown rather than campaign. A campaign tends to uh, suggest there's a beginning and an end. 
And what I'm going to suggest in a minute is that uh, Xi Jinping's uh, crackdown in, that begins in 2013 is actually, in effect, the fifth offensive in a war on corruption uh, that in the post Mao period began really in 1982. But if you think about it, it's the, it's the latest in a very long series of anti-corruption drives by the, uh, the Communist Party of China that began really in the 1950s. And if you go back even prior to the formation of the People's Republic, there were campaigns against corruption within the party uh, going back to, to almost to its, its, uh, to its origins in the 1920s. So let me move ahead. Uh, there we go. Um, if you look at this, this charts the number of investigations by the old Discipline Inspection Commission and its new incarnation, um, the Supervisory Commission. Um, as you can see, the numbers shoot up dramatically beginning in 2013 on the number of party investigations. Uh, one of the reasons that people have pointed to for this increase was uh, the adoption of something called the eight point regulation. The rate eight point regulation basically covers um, not so much corruption as a kind of um, extravagance at the at public expense. Um, Xi Jinping was famous early on for going to a restaurant in Beijing and ordering a very simple meal, reaching into his pocket, paying 21 kwai for the meal sitting down with the other patrons, et cetera. It was famous for him announcing that henceforth there would be uh, four dishes and a soup would be all that would serve, no more Mao Tai. Um, uh, in fact, in many cases, no alcohol at all. Um, actually, the four dishes and a soup go back to the early 1990s. It was not Xi Jinping's invention. And the eight point regulation does not explain the huge jump that we see in the number of party members investigated. You will notice that my data really end at about 2018. Uh, the last couple of years, there have been changes in the way they report the data, both for the, uh, the party uh, discipline inspection slash supervisory commission, but more importantly, also in the case of the procuratorate, which actually is the judicial body. Um, if you look at the chart, it's quite striking the number of party investigations skyrockets. But that lower line, which is the number of judicial actions in this chart, the number of people who are uh, who have cases filed against them, and this is the kind of second step that the uh, procuratorate undertakes in, in an investigation. It goes up a little bit, 2013, 2014. And as you can see by 2016, it's actually fallen back to the levels of prior to the campaign. Well, this is the aggregate number. And of course, aggregate numbers mean that you not only have the, uh, the rank and file or what the Chinese press likes to call the flies, but you have much bigger fish as well. So when we break the procuratorial numbers down and look at it by level, what you can see is at the bottom there, I have the rank and file, the, the flies, and that number actually doesn't change dramatically. It's running in the mid, uh, around uh, 35,000 uh, a year, and it doesn't shoot up. The number of people at the county and departmental level, uh, which uh, it's sometimes referred to in the Chinese press as the rat, Lao Hu, uh, La, Lao Shu, um, they, go up, uh, they go up quite a bit. But where you really see the increase is in people at the prefectural and bureau level, and then also, of course, at the provincial and the ministerial level. And there you get these very big jumps um, in 2014, 2015. But again, you will notice that they begin to fall off as well. Let's take this into a kind of longer historical uh, perspective and see where we are in, in the war on corruption. This charts the, uh, the number of cases filed and charting this over time is a little tricky because in 1997, they rewrote the criminal code. They decriminalized cases, which resulted in a big drop in the number of cases filed, but in fact, probably didn't result in that much of a difference when, when you net out the ones that were decriminalized. 
uh, they started changing the way they reported the data um, in about 2003, 2004. And I've tried, if you look at the dashed line and the kind of lower level, that's my attempt to create a long-term theory. And what you can see is we get the first big crackdown in 1982, another one in 1986, and then a huge one in 1989. The one in 89, of course, is a response to the, uh, the anti-government demonstrations um, and was very much a, uh, a, an attempt by the party to deal with demand for action against high-level corruption. What's important about all three of these is they are all crackdowns on the rank and file. There are some senior people that get caught up over the years. Of course, Chen Shitong in 1995, Chen Liang Yu in 2006. But by and large, during this period, these three first campaigns, crackdowns one, two, and three, are crackdowns on the rank and file. When we look at the next two levels, the rats and the wolves, as I like to call them, uh, we have flies, we have tigers, we need to have animals for the other two. Um, if you look at the, uh, the number of people at the county and the departmental level, that goes up quite dramatically in 1993, 94, 95, jumping from about 180 a year to an average in recent years of somewhere in the order of 24 to 2,500. And again, that goes up dramatically in 2013, 14, and 15, only then to fall back to its pre-2013 uh, pre uh, level. The number of people at the prefecture, um, it's a little hard to know what they were doing before 1998. Uh, they didn't report the data separately. My guess is the pattern looks probably similar to what we see in the case of the county and departmental level, but again, a fairly dramatic jump in, uh, in 2014 and 2015, and then falling back down, not to its previous level, remaining elevated, at, but again, um, moving back down toward where it was before. Uh, here we have the tiger hunt. Um, I have plotted this by quarter, going back to 2001. Um, tigers technically are individuals holding the rank of vice governor, uh, deputy party, uh, provincial party secretary, uh, vice minister, and above. Um, since we don't actually always know the precise level that people uh, put precise rank uh, people hold, um, it's a little bit hard sometimes to figure out who is a tiger and who is simply a very large cat. Um, and so the numbers vary a little bit. Um, this is my count, uh, but you can see quite, uh, quite striking is that prior to 2011, between 2000 and 2011, only 42 people at the most senior level. And you can see I've put in the, the numbers themselves are the annual totals. Uh, you know, five, one, five, eight, three, two, fairly low numbers. And, you know, if you look at some of these, some of them are related to particular scandals. Um, 2006, you'll notice the number goes up. And of course, what that is, that's Chen Liang Yu and his uh, and the, the, the crackdown on, on, on the Shanghai case. If you look at after that, uh, after 2013, between 2013, and I'm happy to say yesterday morning, um, 238, so a dramatically larger number. I uh, singled out 2012 uh, simply because officially the campaign begins in 2013 um, I actually think it began in 2012, and that began uh, not with Boshi Live necessarily, but I think actually it begins, I think the genesis is more in 2011 uh, with the case against uh, Gu Zhenchang, the deputy director of the PLA logistical department. And I think, I think that case um, in particular was a signal uh, not only to uh, Xi Jinping, the heir apparent, but also Hu Jintao and others, that, that there was very serious high-level corruption within the military and possibly within other areas. So as you can see, um, if you were to sum up and ask, um, you know, if you were to say, where is the campaign at today? 
Uh, I would say that the number of the prosecutions and investigations at the senior level remains elevated compared to the pre uh, the pre 2013 levels. Um, it has fallen back down. Uh, we aren't getting the really, you know, kind of spectacular headline busting cases of the Zhou Yang Kongs and Bo Xi Lies. Um, but there's still, you know, there still continues to be this drive um, against uh, corruption at, at the senior level. What makes this interesting, I think, is when we put it in a larger perspective. Um, we looked at this campaign and we look at a series of campaigns. We actually, there, there are a total of five anti-corruption crackdowns uh, by my count, Two, uh, 1990, 1982, 86, 89. I count 94 is a intermediate one. And then of course the high level uh, campaign in, in uh, two, beginning in 2013. Um, in the early 90s, there was an effort begun to create a measure which would allow social scientists to compare levels of corruption. And in those early years, China was, I think it ranked number six in one of the early polls. And if you, if you actually track the Transparency International um, uh, ratings, uh, you'll see it's quite striking, is that uh, the red line is China, um, the black line is the, uh, is the mean, uh, the blue line is the median, so the middle of the pack is somewhere between those two uh, blue lines. And if you were to, to read the kind of outside assessments, uh, what I call the perceived level of corruption in China, and this is what um, you know, people ask me, how corrupt is China? Uh, I actually respond, I really don't know, because I just don't know how corrupt other countries are. Um, but perhaps I'm too close to the subject to actually have an opinion. Um, but if you look at it, it's quite striking. China regresses towards the medium, and it is dead in the middle of the pack, um, beginning almost uh, 15 years ago. Um, it continued to, to regress toward the mean, except for that blip in 2014. And what is that blip? That is the, that is the people that transparency is using to generate their corruption perception index. That's their reaction to the campaign. So what happens is when we look at this, and I'm not trying to, yeah, you know, to, to tell you that transparency isn't doing a good job, but what this is, is this is a reading of where the anti-corruption effort is, what the anti-corruption effort is revealing. And as I began to get into this project, and what I did was I was building a database. I kind of track is who's being indicted, um, you know, and the, some specifics about the case. And I was particularly interested not only in the date that they stopped being corruption, but the date that they started being corruption. And this is an idea I, I, uh, I, I would attribute, although I'm sure others have thought about it, to uh, Professor Guo Yang at Tsinghua University who published a, a piece in the China Quarterly, a SOAC publication, uh, a number of years ago. But he, he started really talking about the importance of looking at when did people begin to be uh, corrupt. Well, uh, right now I'm, I'm in a position to, to give you some data on the tigers. Um, data is not complete because of course, uh, when you look at the process, the way that a case is generally revealed, uh, the first thing is an announcement of an investigation. The second is an announcement of, their, uh, of the results of the party investigation, generally spells out, um, uh, you know, whether they were expelled from the party uh, and so forth, uh, remanded to, to the procuratorate. Uh, those statements in some ways are often boilerplate. Uh, you can get on the CCDI website and they, they you know, report them out on a kind of daily basis. Um, they're interesting in themselves in that if you read them, 
they're basically a description of what the party sees as uh, the malfeasance it's dealing with. And it's a combination of uh, essentially criminal corruption, bribery, embezzlement, uh, misappropriation. It's also a, uh, it also involves political disobedience, disloyalty to the party. Uh, but then there's a lot of personal things, um, carrying on extramarital affairs, gambling, so on and so forth. But that doesn't really provide you a lot of information. We really don't pick up case specific information until there's a conviction. And at that point, we learn how much, when, who, et cetera. And so what I've done is I, of my 238 tigers, I, I've plotted those that I have the complete data for. And here's what I think is, is where we begin to get into the interesting part of the analysis. Um, the tigers Xi Jinping has bagged since 2013 were almost all involved in corruption well before the anti-corruption campaign. If you scan the, the line, it tracks the cumulative percentage. 50% of them were, had been involved in corruption for over 10 years before the beginning of the campaign. Almost all of them had, be, had turned corrupt well in advance of the campaign. So when you look at it, what this chart tells you is Xi Jinping is not reacting to some sudden short-term change. I think he certainly was reacting to the two cases, the Gu Jinshan case, uh, the Bo Xilai case, et cetera. Those were, I think, triggers. But I think what he's fighting, and to get back to my question of what is, what is Xi Jinping fighting, He's fighting corruption that took off in the 1990s and on into the first decade of the 21st century. Um, that's important because what it tells you when you go back to the previous figure that I showed you about uh, what we perceived or what experts perceived about corruption in China is they entirely miss what appears to be a major dynamic. And this is the advent of serious high-level corruption. But at the time, it was not high-level corruption. If you go back to this period, if you go back to 1992 or 1993, when Zhou Yang Kang, for example, was allegedly uh, first becoming involved in corruption, he was a low-level manager with the, patrol, uh, the Chinese National Petroleum Company. What happens with him? and with Bo Xi Lai and with these other tigers is they rise up through the ranks. They move from being, in most cases, these are not flies. These are not your village party secretaries, your deputy directors of offices of bureaus at the county and levels. They start off at the mid level, but what's important is this, and this is where the next step comes into the analysis, is you need to look at careers. What this figure is telling you is these people start at a medium level. So not to imply that Xi Jinping is corrupt, um, but he begins at the county level and he gets promoted over and over again. So first of all, you have this long period where people are quote unquote, in effect, getting, getting away with it. So what I did was to actually look at how long had people been involved in corruption. Um, and again, this is looking only at the tigers, looking at the rank and file is, shall we say, a little bit more challenging because there are a heck of a lot of them. Um, and gathering the data is, 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 is a somewhat complicated uh, process. But what this looks at is, uh, this looks at how many years had elapsed between when someone became corrupt and when they stopped being corrupt. And if you look at it, you know, a fairly a not insignificant amount of people get caught early on in their first year. But then it's, if you look at it, people are getting away with it for 13, for an average of 12, 13, 14 years. Um, and here in you have to think about, you have to think about corruption as a kind of iterated game of chance in which once you become involved in corruption, through every time period 
there's a chance of getting caught. And so what you have is, if you've been corrupt for 13 or 14 years, you have had repeated chances of being exposed. And in the case of these senior people's people, uh, senior officials who the, the, the quote unquote tigers, part of that occurs when they get promoted. When you get promoted in China, they're supposed to do an audit. When you leave an office, you're supposed to get audited. And yet what this is, these charts, these two charts in combination are telling us is the system repeatedly failed. Remember, I talked about four anti-corruption crackdowns before the 2013. If the system had been working, many of these people should have been weeded out before they reached the ranks in which you could become a potential tiger. Obviously, some people at the top are not tigers, they're lions uh, because they're actually uh, honest and upright officials. But what we get is this major breakdown in the system prior to uh, prior to the advent of the campaign. Um, so let me move on. I do want to leave plenty of time for questioning uh, questions. Um, this is one other thing that I had been working on is that um, in this, I went back and forth on whether to share this chart or not, because as I'll tell you in a second, there, there, it may be somewhat misleading, but I think it's, it's intriguing and it's worth thinking about. And what this did was to track the number of people who were identified as having retired before they were prosecuted. Back in 2013, 2000, uh, 2012, 13, 14, one of the things that was brought up repeatedly about the importance of the prosecution of Zhou Yan Khan was the fact that he was retired. He had been a member of the Politburo Standing Committee. He retired because of his age in 2012, 17th Party Congress, um, 18th, 18th Party Congress. Um, and there was some, you know, there was some talk out there about the fact that if you somehow navigated to the point, if you got away with it until you retired, that was something of a protection. Well, this chart suggests that one of the things that 2013 campaign, uh, post 2013 campaign has really, has really changed is retirement is no longer uh, an escape. There is no, in effect, statute of age limitation that if you don't get caught while you're an official, well, bygones will be bygones. Um, so that's, that's one of the big changes. But also what it tells you is that it is possible that not, you know, that one of the things that uh, Xi Jinping has done since 2013 is they have begun not only to try and deal with current corruption, but they are also trying to address previous corruption. And therefore, they are going after people who retired. And in some cases, it's a year, it's a two, it's three years. But there are people who retired five, six, seven, I think I found one that had retired almost 10 years earlier. Um, and so it does seem that what he's done is there's, a, there's not only an intensification of the corruption that we see in the rise in the number of current officials being investigated, prosecuted, and, uh, and uh, punished, but also a deepening in the sense that they're going in back into the history of the, uh, or back into previous periods in order to root out um, previous, uh, previous corruption. So let me try to bring this all together and suggest what, and to make it, to, to give you an idea of where I'm thinking and why I'm taking so long to get this book done. Um, if you look at this chart, and it's, it's a fairly simple one, and it's an attempt to show you the kind of high, the bureaucratic or the hierarchy of the party state. Uh, tigers, of course, make up a tiny fraction of the total at the very top. Below them are the wolves, the rats, and the flies. And of course, the flies make up statistically the vast majority of people involved in corruption but also the, the, of the officiate at large. If what these charts 
to what these charts tell me is not only do you have to look into the past, not only do you have to go back and say, well, what was going on in the mid 1990s, in the early 2000s, that would have created new opportunities, new incentives for people to turn to corruption. But you also have to go back and look at what was going on among the lower levels. Because these tigers of today grew up. They started out probably as rats. They turned into wolves and they rose up. And so what matters is if we want to understand what were the incentives, what was going on at these levels back 10 years ago, back a number of years ago. So I've begun to try and compile a fairly uh, extensive database on, on rank and file lower level corruption so that I can begin to put the tigers into context. And here, what I think I'm, what I, what I'm trying to get at is, I don't wanna just look at the tigers in their cages. I don't wanna just be able to look at them once they get caught. I wanna look at the tigers in the wild. I want to know what was the jungle like that they turned into tigers that they navigated from being mid-level officials to intermediate level officials and on up. And so what, I, what I'm trying to get at in the book and trying to get across uh, in this talk is uh, we've had a major problem with how we have looked at corruption in the past. We have essentially looked at it in a fairly superficial manner. We have concentrated on people who have gotten corrupt. We ask, well, who were they? Okay, so Joe Young Kong is a member of the Politburo, former uh, secretary of the Politics and Law Commission, minister of public security, uh, first or party secretary of Chongqing, and the minister of commerce, general, uh, general manager of Chinese National Petroleum. All that's important, but we need to unpack. We need to know what was the context Back when he was in Panjian, he was a minor official. He becomes, I think it was mayor of Panjian City. What were conditions like? And particularly what we need to know because what really, what shapes the environment in terms of corruption are the three Ps. The payoffs, the probabilities, and the penalties. We need to know a great deal more about rank and file corruption, about mid-level corruption, before we can really begin to focus in on the significance, not only of the who and the why questions that I started with, but the what. And what is it that, China, that Xi Jinping is really battling? Is he really just battling a number, a fairly finite number of, of tigers and wolves and rats and so forth. Or what my analysis suggests is he is battling a much larger systemic problem. And it's a systemic problem that has deep roots that we need to go back to the 90s. We need to go back to the 2000s and think about what was going on there. So then now it is time for my uh, self-criticism. Uh, because this gets me into what has been one of the, the challenges of writing this new book. Because of course, if you go back in 2012, at about the same time that Bo Xi Lai was getting in trouble and the anti interest in corruption and anti-corruption began to take off, I of course published a book, Double Paradox, uh, Rapid Growth and Rising Corruption in China in which I was seeking to, to address what I called a double paradox, two puzzles. One was that China had had rapid growth, even though corruption was apparently getting worse in the 1980s and in the mid 1990s. So I, I wanted to try and explain that. And part of the explanation, which I still cleave to is, Corruption was a product of the transition. It was a product of the commodification of things that had uh, little, little 
tangible value under the old planned economy system. They were being moved onto the market. They suddenly were all of these windfall profits that entrepreneurs and others were going to make. And essentially, my argument was officialdom decided that they should get a piece of the action too. The other part of my argument was that once you got through this transition, once the windfall profits and the rents began to dissipate, that China's anti-corruption effort, those campaigns, those three campaigns in the, in the 80s that cracked down in the 90s, my argument was that it, China had managed, if not to eradicate or to reduce corruption, it had managed to get it under control. And what the analysis I started off working on in 2000, I actually started writing this book and I think it was the summer of 2014. And then I backed off then because um, it was clear the action was still going on and I didn't want to write something prematurely. Um, more recently, the, the, the thing I'm, re I'm wrestling with is uh, corruption on a kind of aggregate level may not have gotten any worse. It may not have become any more prevalent. But what the data from Xi Jinping's anti-corruption crackdown, and particularly what this, this piece that I've looked at so far, the piece that's concentrated on the, in effect, seemingly large, but actually quite small group of tigers, the ones that are in the cages now, is that in fact, corruption was deepening in the period, in the decade plus before Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign. And it was deepening in the sense that it was moving up. It was moving up through this pyramid. And that if mid-level corruption was common in the 90s, what we see and what the data from the campaign suggests is that by the time Xi Jinping, and I actually think Hu Jintao had a hand in it, um, I think what happened in 2011, in 2012, is they started staring into the abyss that corruption was not a few bad apples. It was not a lower level problem. It was a systemic problem in the sense that they were failing to correct, uh, to, to catch people at the intermediate level before they became politically powerful before they, you know, when they were still much easier to target than when they were in the Politburo, but they had gotten into the Politburo. And therefore what Xi Jinping is dealing with is not only a problem of tigers, he's dealing with a problem of a jungle that the party really has not effectively controlled and not been able to effectively weed out those at the mid-level who could be, who could evolve or morph from being rats and wolves into tigers. I will stop there and I am happy to entertain uh, questions. Uh, Professor Sai. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. That was really fantastic talk with enormous amount of data that you have built up. So if I may get it started before I open it to the floor. Corruption, particularly when we are looking at um, not individual corruptions, but organized corruption, can fall into different types. It could be syndicates, it could be systemic, it could be a bit of both. In the case that you're talking about, fundamentally from anything that is syndicated and above, a more organized form, corruption is a bit light and not an omnibus, as they used to say. You either get on it, or if you stand in front of it, you get run over. And this is the point that you make, that once you're in the bus, you can't really get off it so easily. So this, this is part of your, your deepening process of how it got from flies to tigers. Now, if this is what we're looking at, and also bearing in mind how much a Chinese minister and therefore tiger is being paid. 
and the official salary will not, I don't think, cover the cost of the tuition fee, let alone tuition fee plus living cost of an offspring studying at, say, Harvard. And it's not an unreasonable expectation for an offspring of a Chinese minister to want to go to Harvard if he or she can make it there. Are we looking at a situation that, in fact, we are not only talking about syndicate corruption, but systemic corruption? That people is very difficult not to be. And if this is the case, and we are looking at syndicate corruption, then out of your 238 tigers, how many of those tigers belongs to people who had previously worked with or for Xi Jinping, political protégés of some sort of Xi Jinping? Because if we are talking about systemic corruption, the chance that if you were a Xi protégé, you would never have been involved in corruption. But if you were a non Xi protégé, you have a much higher chance that you are just doesn't seem to hold water, does it? Um, well, this is, this is the ultimate stumbling block of corruption. Um, the answer is we only know about those who get caught. We don't know about those who don't get caught. Do they not get caught because they're honest or are they, do they not get caught because they're lucky or do they get caught but not prosecuted because they are beloved? They are beloved by those above them. Um, frankly, uh, you know, it does, of course, is striking that uh, not many of Xi Jinping's protégés have been prosecuted. But do we know that is because they are protégés of Xi Jinping and he is protecting them? Or are they protégés of Xi Jinping because they're honest? Um, Frankly, short of being able to administer sodium pentothal to a large uh, block of the Central Committee, um, I don't know. And I think you know this is this is the problem we deal with: is we only are able to look at the percentage of officials, a corrupt uh, the percentage of corrupt officials who get caught. Um, there are those who you know have there there have been econometric studies done which seem to suggest that yes, you, if you are associated with Xi, you are less likely to be prosecuted. But again, I get back to it's a chicken and the egg question. Are they not prosecuted because they're guilty and he protected them? Are they not prosecuted because he selected them because they're honest? And I don't know the answer. Uh, to answer your other question, when you talk about syndicated corruption, um, of course, the idea is there, and the, the, where we get the term syndicated corruption is, is from the Hong Kong police, where the rank and file, the, the street, uh, the, the, the beat police uh, used to shake down various establishments, legal and otherwise. Um, they would collect protection money. They would hand it over to the sergeant who would hand it over to the precinct captain, and it would be handed on up the line. Another term for this, which is popular uh, what enjoyed a certain amount of popularity in recent years is kleptocracy. In other words, a state, um, a state run by the corrupt for the purposes of corruption. Um, if you look at, uh, and I, I, I wrote a paper on this a number of years ago, published in the Journal of Democracy. Um, kleptocracy basically posits that the state is a form of organized crime and that the person at the top is in effect the godfather and that as the godfather he basically parcels out opportunities to his capos his his captains who in turn uh, parcel out opportunities to those below him um i don't think that the chinese state is a kleptocracy and i think this in part for the simple reason that we know a great deal about corruption in China because China fights corruption. For all of the shortfalls that the anti-corruption campaign might have, China has been fighting corruption since the 1950s. And some may get uh, caught, some might get protected, some might get away with it. But it's not like many of the other kleptocracies where we see you have a kleptocratic 
a kleptocrat in chief uh, surrounded by his lieutenants, all of them breaking off. You know, if you go back to the kind of classic model of Zaire under, uh, under Mobutu, uh, you don't have that in China. And that was one of the paradoxes in my book, um, which had to do with the contrast between corruption in Japan and Korea, Taiwan to a certain extent, and, uh, and, the, and uh, uh, the People's Republic. I don't see the regime itself as completely corrupt, but to answer your question in a very long-winded fashion, I have no reason to believe that Xi Jinping is corrupt. I don't know how he's managed to pay the Harvard tuition. Um, I don't frankly know how I put my daughter through college either. Um, my wife did that. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it is clear that official pay is a problem. Uh, if you have looked into official salaries in, Ch in China, uh, they're very complicated. Uh, the salary itself is a mere part of it. Uh, you know, Bo Xi Lai said his wife had made all the money. Maybe she did, maybe she didn't. But yeah, I mean, official pay is a problem. And when the head of China makes a fraction of what I as a professor make, uh, that's a problem. And when the ministers make a fraction of what I make, that's a problem. The problem is this, how do you address that? If you're Xi Jinping, do you get on CCTV and say, look, my fellow Chinese, uh, the problem is our officials are corrupt because we don't pay them enough and therefore we should pay them more. In other words, corruption pays. Politically, that's a hard sell, even in China. Uh, so I think you know, the answer is, yeah, you're right. Official pay is, is a problem. How do you deal with that? That, that's, that's a political conundrum that fortunately I don't have to solve uh, this Tuesday morning. Okay, let's, let's move on. There are at least uh, a dozen of questions that I have noticed already. Let me ask you a question that came in from Graham Hutchings. He says that much of your presentations depends on the analysis of cases from legal and party sources. How reliable is this information? Could it not simply be fabricated? How can we verify it? Second, does, do you know of any cases in which the official charge or tried confirm charges that has been found not guilty? Have you found any case of anybody being charged or tried who has been found not guilty? Thank you. Um, well, the answer to the first question is, uh, tell me where else to look. Um, you know, if you, if you, you know, I, I spent a lot of time reading this and, you know, I, I'm not only reading the Western press, uh, but I'm, all, you know, I'm not only reading the Chinese data, but also the Western press. Um, if you look what comes out through outlets like, um, uh, South China Morning Post and others, uh, they all trace back to the Chinese state. And the Chinese state has a monopoly on the original information. Um, you can get rumors, you can get speculation, uh, you can get very good investigations that have been done by uh, uh, you know, Michael Forsyth and David Barboza at New York Times, uh, Chris B uh, Buckley also. Um, and they look at a few cases. They look at the big cases. And one of the things that has struck me in reading this data is, you know, what appears in the English language press is just a tiny, tiny, tiny tip of a tip of a tip. Um, there are great big cases out there that receive absolutely no notice outside of the Chinese legal system. So are they fabricated? Um, quite a fabrication process to, um, you know, the, the one database I, I'm looking at has, I hate to say it, has data on 100,000 corruption cases. Uh, it's a fabrication on a grand scale. And I think, I think when you look at some of the top cases, they do get very spongy. Um, I don't know if you, you've noticed, but with, she, with uh, neither Bo Xi Lai nor uh, Zhou Yang Kang, have they ever provided a start date? 
and uh, you know they they there's a lot of detail that they leave out, particularly as the high level cases. Um, do people get found innocent? Well, the answer is actually it's a complicated answer because when you look at the corruption process, it's a multi-stage process. And so if you go back and think about my first figure, think of those you know, hundreds of thousands of people who get investigated by the party. A fraction of them get referred to the procuratory. They get a legal uh, referral, cases remanded. It undergoes an investigation. Um, it's a two-step process. They are a three-step process within the procuratory. They accept a case for investigation. Uh, if they think the prima facie evidence supports uh, a formal investigation, they file the case, and then eventually they seek an indict indictment. Uh, beyond that, then of course they go to court. Uh, the gearing between those is quite substantial. The problem is they don't tell you about the 50% cut as they go from each level. Uh, are these people found innocent? Are these people given administrative sanctions? Uh, a lot of people in the party get what's called a party warning or a severe party warning. No one has ever been able to explain to me what a, how a warning versus a severe warning uh, differs. I guess it's a warning with a wag of a finger or something, which is probably a glib answer. But yes, people do get found innocent. Um, the problem is, and, um, they, they simply don't report on it very often. Do people get found innocent at trial? The answer is very, very rarely. It's less than 1%. But uh, I, I, I believe from what Steve said, I, I think the, the question is from someone at a legal firm. Um, a good prosecutor in the United States never goes to court thinking they're going to lose. They never go to court with a 50-50 chance. They want to go with a near certain, otherwise they'll try to plea bargain it uh, and continue the investigation. So even in the US, if you get hauled into court, uh, unless you're rich, powerful, and can afford really good lawyers, uh, you're likely to be found guilty. And I would suggest in the case of China, uh, yeah, um, my favorite, one of my favorite lines was reading about someone who had been arrested, um, had like not on corruption charge, I forget what the charges was, and he was pleading his innocence to the interrogator and the interrogator said, well, how could you be innocent if I'm interrogating you? And I think once, once you're in the system, once the allegations have been made, um, your best bet is to try and bargain your way out with a plea bargain. But uh, there's a tiny fraction of people who do get found innocent, but a great deal, a, a considerable percentage of those who were investigated, in other words, have accusations made out against them do not end up in court and do not end up in prison. Um, but again, they simply, uh, the, the party has never been a great share of information and they don't tell you, oh, 50% of the investigations we opened proved to be uh, completely uh, false and untenable. Um, they just don't do that. They just give you the number of investigations and it's up to you to guess what, what happened to them as, as the numbers fall through the process of the investigation prosecution and conviction process. Okay. Next question from Norman Stockman. Is it possible to move beyond the study of corrupt individuals to networks of corruption? Could lower level corrupt individuals in quotation marks get away with it because of connections to corrupt superiors? Uh, well, <laughs> is the syndicate uh, corruption question? Really? Yeah, um, one of the things that that you know people are people, myself included, are always interested in is what are the interconnections between people, um, and here you know I have tried to track them at the high level, and it, it's problematic. I mean, in one in some cases, you're able actually to like to link people up who have been, you know, if you look at Joe Yon Kong, for example, you can network, you can map out a whole network of his protégés um, and uh, cronies, et cetera. Um, 
my sense is when you get further down the food chain or the hierarchy, uh, the same thing is true, that people are not, in some cases, it does not appear that they're hiding it. Uh, there's no way that a lot of these people could haul in the kinds of, and this mostly is the rats and wolves. Uh, yeah, the rats and wolves. Uh, there's no way that they can hide what they're doing. And oftentimes you'll find that, you know, a case will involve collusion between um, a number of individuals. Um, the problem with answering your question in a kind of further, you know, is could they get away with it? Well, unless they get caught, they're getting away with it. And so we can't map those. Could you turn around and map someone's entire career network? And this is where you really get into it, to a broader question is, you know, when you look at the top, if you look at the people that are, you know, the couple of thousand who would be potential tigers, it's an incestuous group. Um, a lot of these people have worked together. They have family connections. Um, if you've risen up to the top of a very large party state hierarchy, uh, you have a lot of former colleagues. You have a lot of people who are protégés. You probably have a lot of people who are your enemies. So the answer is networks clearly matter. But in looking at the tigers, uh, my, my, the last time I looked, and, and it's a bit tedious to do given the software I have right now, and uh, we're trying to transition the system that'll make it somewhat easier. You know, I find that about a third of those of the tigers have no overt collect connection to any of the other tigers. So in, a set, in effect, a third of them or more are what I would call free ranging tigers. Um, Tigers, by the way, in the wild tend to be free ranging anyway. Um, and so the, the next part gets kind of tricky if you're an animal, an animal specialist. Uh, the, other do, the others do seem to have connections and connections do matter. Are those connections, you know, are they in effect a mafia? And, you know, when I spent time looking at particularly the Zhou Yang Kang case, but also the Ling Chi Wa case is actually, the, in some ways, the more complex and interesting. Is um, they seem to be parts of what I would call loosely organized uh, bands of bandits. That they're all basically kind of freelancing. They're covering for each other, but they're not operating as a group. Now, having said that, if you look at the uh, the Yang Chi case, this one involving the Jingling Man. Uh, um, you know, the villas built in Xinlin uh, Nature Reserve. If you look at the Jiangxi um, earthquake, uh, there it does appear that you have these, uh, these much more tightly organized uh, syndicated corruption. But again, I look at them as, uh, to go back to Steve's, uh, to Professor Sang's question is, I don't see them organized all the way up. I see them as a series of localized, uh, syndicates operating independently of each other. Uh, so yeah, I yeah, network network is is good. Um, when you get down to the lower levels, you know, it's it's very common in, in village cases. Okay. To see that it's the it's the party secretary, it's the director, it's the accountant that are involved. Okay. Um Andrew. Yeah. Um, a couple of people have mentioned that you are you're fading away a little bit. So if you could sort of be a bit closer to the mic, that would be helpful. Um, How's this? I'm better? sure that much much better. Um, the next question I picked from Jonathan Fenby, who wants to ask you about the politics behind the setting of targets, of 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 targets not in terms of numbers, but targets of tigers to be taken down. How were they chosen? Is there politics behind? Um, I think, yeah, I think, well, uh, I'm, I'm somewhat intimidated trying to answer a question by Jonathan Fenby, um, given his long experience in, in, in this, this area. Um, my sense, and of course, I don't sit in on any of these meetings, is that um, before a tiger case gets too far down the road, um, the top is consulted. And 
Uh, what happens then? Is there a go ahead? Um, are some people considered too sensitive? That's, that's behind the curtain. That's something that uh, I don't know. And I, I'm, I'm not sure how you would, um, you would be able to pierce it because again, we don't know if the people being not being prosecuted are actually not corrupt. And you know, if you look at some of the investigative work the New York Times uh, has done, Bloomberg, um, you know, it, uh, yeah, it it does appear that yeah, people must be making a decision that certain people are untouchable. But I think I would move to answer this in a somewhat broader fashion, in that. Um, while we talk about corruption and corruption as being a specific crime, the misuse of uh, delegated authority, public authority in the case of officials, um, I think it's part of a larger issue in that, you know, when China starts the reform period back in the early 1980s, it has no millionaires, it has no billionaires, it really has no uh, capitalists and entrepreneurs, um, no movers and shakers. All of those emerge out of the reform process. And in the process, it is certainly true that members of families, friends, old school uh, comrades, etc., some become officials and some become wealthy. And so what I think that the bigger problem is, is that wealth and power in China is connected by uh, blood, marriage, old school tie, et cetera. And that in the West, we somehow, uh, we think at least that we have some way of separating wealth and power, that they're in two separate spheres. I think in the case of China, they overlap. The lines are fuzzy. Um, to what extent have people taken advantage uh, to what extent of people connected with those with power, taking advantage of that power, whether it be in a toward or untoward manner. And uh, I'll give you an example that always strikes me. We could talk about more contemporary ones, but I don't really want to touch what's going on today. Um, we have Chelsea Clinton. And I have nothing against Chelsea Clinton. Uh, I'm sure she's a very smart, able uh, woman. But uh, after she graduated, um, I forget, she had done some time, she had spent some time at either Cambridge or uh, Oxford, as I recall. She returned to the United States and she got a job at a hedge fund. Now, I am pretty certain that two weeks after she started, she didn't have coffee with her boss and her boss said, Who, what, your dad is Bill Clinton? I had no idea because I hired you strictly on your merit. Um, it happens in the United States. Uh, the Sons and Daughters program that JP Morgan got caught with a number of years ago, um, that's common to most political economies. Is it worse in China? Probably. Does that, and to answer your, your question, uh, Jonathan, uh, does that mean that people connected with uh, people running the anti-corruption campaign or crackdown are themselves involved in activities that uh, might be prosecutable? I, I would guess yes. Um, how did they, did they get a get out of jail free card? I don't know, but uh, I would hazard that certainly it is true. Anything that's involving someone at the very top probably gets vetted by those at the very, very top before a decision is made to, to go forward or to go public. Because, of course, you can go after someone without telling people you went after them. Okay, I'll move on. To, uh, we've got quite a lot of other questions. Um, the next set of questions I'm going to raise is from one of our colleagues, um, Olivia John. She would like to ask you, what has Xi Jinping done to keep the disciplinary investigators under check? How does Xi Jinping guard the guardians? The second question from her is that um, amongst those who were brought back to China for trial via the fox hunt or Skynet operations, 
um, who are they? Who, who are the foxes? And be, relatedly, for those who were listed on Interpol as red notice for corruption cases, how, how does that work? Who would qualify to be put on the red list? And finally, is Xi Jinping sparing the princelings? Uh Guarding the guards is, of course, a perennial problem. Um, you know, if you've been involved in corruption and you're facing an investigation and you're sitting on a pile of cash and facing the possibility of a 10 or 15 year prison sentence, your incentives to try and buy off the prosecutor, uh, the investigators are fairly high. We certainly do have evidence of people in the justice system, in the disciplinary system, taking bribes. Uh, one of the latest drives of late has been against corruption in the po politics and law system. So they have gone after some prosecutors. Uh, they've gone after some others. Uh, you certainly do see a number of uh, very senior judicial figures have been prosecuted, uh, members of the high provincial court, uh, et cetera. Um, so guarding the guardians is always hard. And of course, uh, the reorganization of the system back in 2017 from the, uh, the combination of the party discipline inspection uh, commission, the state ministry of supervision, which in fact been operating together since the early 1990s, and then creating this new supervisory commission by bringing in elements of the procuratorate uh, part of that is to try and more tightly guard and tightly um, uh, monitor the, the the guards of the system, if you will. Um, certainly, he has tried things like trying to increase the centralization of the system, trying to make sure that local party discipline inspection commissions answer more readily to Beijing than they do to the corresponding party committee at the other level. It's a perennial problem in China that goes back to imperial days of how do you penetrate into a very large, sprawling uh, party uh, party state. Um, so yeah, they have taken measures. How effective they are, again, gets back to we know who gets caught. We don't know who doesn't get caught. So we don't know if a lot of the guards are getting away with it. Are only a few of the guards getting prosecuted? Again, it's a very hard answer to question. Uh, the Foxnet, Foxnet in, in the red notice question is, is quite interesting because if you go back, if you look at the, the hundred foxes that they originally listed, um, they're not a very impressive group. They're mid-level officials, uh, they're low-level officials. Some of them aren't even officials in the sense that they were involved in various kinds of uh, financial uh, fraud and, and crime. Um, it, it, they have brought back, and they like to, you know, they make a big deal of when they get people back. Um, uh, among those is, you know, there are no, there, there are no very senior-level people in that list. Um, does that mean they're ones that have escaped overseas? I don't know, because I would suspect that it wouldn't be that easy for a former provincial party secretary to simply uh, pack, pack up and move to Los Angeles or to Auckland or to, uh, to Sydney. So again, it's, it's one of these things we don't know. The red notice thing also gets complicated in that a red notice is actually just a kind of uh, oh, by the way, I'm looking for this person. Please call me if you if you see them. Um, for people in the United States, uh, extradition is not possible. We don't have an extradition treaty with them, with the with the, the PRC. Um, so you know there are people in the U.S. that the Chinese would like. Uh, Ling Jiwa's brother is apparently somewhere in the United States. Um, I think Chris Buckley tracked his down his house somewhere in the. Uh, San Francisco suburbs. Uh, the neighbors said they hadn't seen him in months. Um, but in that case, with uh, Ling Wan Chen, they 
you know, I am told that the Chinese have asked the U.S. government to try and track him down and send him back. Uh, they have not, as far as I know, put in a red notice for him. Um, and again, what the U.S. tells the Chinese is, well, we can't, just because you accuse someone of a crime, we can't deport them because we don't recognize the validity of a criminal charge in the case of China. Uh, I have talked to some people who have suggested that what the U.S. has done is to tell the Chinese uh, we can't deport them for violations of law in China, but we can deport them for law violations of law in the United States, including visa fraud, uh, money laundering, and so forth. Um, you know, and of course, you know, I have seen reports that the Chinese say that there are 14,000 uh, fugitive officials. Uh, the, the number of people listed as foxes, the number of red notices out there uh, do not do not come close to that number. So again, I don't know how many people are fugitives here. I don't know how many you know, low level people have escaped having gotten away with a little bit of corruption. Well, maybe not so, so always a little bit, but yeah, the answer is again, um, that's one of those unknowables, imponderables that dog the study of uh, corruption. Okay. Um... We have about 12 minutes left, and I still have about 13 questions in the book. So you, you could I'll be answer started. quickly. Thank you. Um, the next one, um, two people ask in parallel similar questions. So I'll combine them together. And the question is really about the percentage of minority ethnic minorities or women who are being charged with corruption how how are they represented amongst the uh, uh well it is yeah women women are certainly do not appear to be in particularly large numbers um i think part of this is at the rank and file the reporting often uh, does not necessarily include identification of gender. And as a non-Chinese, I can't always figure out if somebody is, you know, if a so-and-so Jian Guo, I, you know, you don't know. Most of the time you can probably guess it's probably a guy. Um, I, think, I think one of the reasons you don't see as many women is that they don't get into positions of power. One of the things is to be corrupt, you have to have power. Um, you know, you need to have something in effect you can sell. Um, I do know in the lower level cases, you see a lot of women who are cashiers, who are accountants, who are accused of embezzlement. Uh, could I give you a firm answer on the gender breakdown? No, uh, but I would say that women are probably underrepresented, partly because they're underrepresented in the ranks of power. Um, the same probably of my, of my ethnic minorities. Um, I know, you know, I have, if, when you get into provinces that have larger ethnic minority pop, populations, um, they certainly do come up more often, but I don't have any concrete number. And again, it gets back to this problem of, I don't know and I can't tell you what the actual rate of corruption is. I can only tell you what the revealed rate is. So I can only tell you about who gets caught. I can't tell you about who doesn't. And therefore, I can't tell you if it's proportionate or disproportionate. OK. Move to something quite different. And this is from uh, Roger Macy. I have heard no mention of the sort of systemic methods for avoiding corruption widely used elsewhere. I heard no mention of open competitive tendering or of the open competitive appointment and no independent auditors. Your suggestion is that all cases have arisen from suspicions and pointing at suspects. That is, the system depends on a perfect Marxist-Leninist morality in all card rates. And nothing I have heard has suggested what I would call a systemic response. Is that a valid summary or have I missed something? 
I'm, I, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. I think um, the question really is about, if you're dealing with corruption, uh, if you're dealing with eradicating corruption, there are alternative ways of dealing with it than the way how it's being done in China. And the kind of ways that are being done, for example, successfully in Hong Kong or Singapore or elsewhere, simply are not being done in China. Uh, well, correct? Is that not correct? Yeah, I, it's, it's actually a good question, because if you go back to the early days of the campaign, uh, 2013, 2014, we had a whole series of cases that involved internet revelations. People had gone through and searched property deeds. They had published pictures of Brother Watch. Um, they had caught Sister House, et cetera. Uh, the party cracked down on that. And there was a regulation passed that if you repeat, if you posted something on the internet that was considered, uh, you know, in, improper, uh, if it got reposted a number of, you know, a couple thousand times, you could be prosecuted. And after that regulation goes into effect, we see a dramatic drop in the number of, of these internet cases. Um, I think, you know, very much what Xi Jinping did early on was he said, this is going to be an internal campaign. This is not going to be a mass campaign. We're not going to involve the public in a active role. Uh, they certainly do. They maintain tip lines. Uh, if you get on, you know, the, the prosecutorial website, if you get on the uh, party discipline website, there are ways for you to file a complaint. And in their annual reports in the old days, the two of them used to tell, tell you how many tips they got. Um, they got a lot of tips, but then you didn't know what they did with the tips. Um, but I think, you know, the, to answer, answer the question is, um, they, they have shied away from allowing outside monitoring and outside auditing. Um, if you have something to say, what they want you to do is to tell it to the party, let them process it, let them look into it. And if there's a case, then uh, they'll do something about it. Uh, what happens to most of those? I think my sense is that, you know, uh, you may have a complaint box, but no one ever empties it. Um, you may collect tips, but no one pays attention to them. Uh, they have not moved to, you know, to basically make the party uh, to increase scrutiny. Um, so yeah, I mean, it is, you are reliant to get back to the earlier question. You're reliant on the, the willingness of the guards to go after, uh, after suspected cases. Um, and again, this is all behind the, the curtain, all in the black box. Um, I am sure that lots of, lots of stuff gets swept under the rug. I am sure there is not perfect socialist morality among the discipline inspection people. Um, but yeah, it is true. Uh, to the extent that outside people were involved, they clamped on, uh, down on that. But the public is involved. They're involved as an audience. And so the anti-corruption campaign, one of the reasons we know so much about this is the party publicizes it because the party publicizes it to show that they're doing something about corruption. No independent investigations, absolutely true. No community monitoring, absolutely true. Okay, next I'm combining a uh, question from two persons from uh, Rodrigo, Rodrigo and Catherine, they're asking in parallel. The question is about what does the Chinese government do about to tackle foreign corruption? And in particular, the international projects in the Belt and Road Initiative countries. Um. There, there, there are, the, the answer is twofold. Is one of the big things they did early in the campaign is they went after foreign pharmaceutical companies. Uh, foreign pharmaceutical companies, as with pharmaceutical companies in general, um, they are notorious for handing out bribes and kickbacks. And the reason is, is that Chinese doctors are miserably paid, and they are uh, very much willing as long as they can get rid of it, to take bribes. Um, 
the Chinese cracked down on it. Uh, it was GlaxoSmithKline, uh, Mr. Humphreys and his wife that um, faced the real crackdown. Uh, there was a signal that, you know, there's no immunity. You can't hire a consultant and have the consultant pays the bribes and then say, well, all we did was to pay the consultant. Uh, they've gone after that internally. How much impact it's had, I think it's hard to tell because again, we see what we see, but we don't see what we don't see. Um, what have they done in the Belt and Road? And that, that gets tricky because, uh, you know, crimes committed in Pakistan are crimes committed in, China, in, in Pakistan. Um, can the Chinese prosecute them? In the, case, you know, in the case of the United States, we have something called Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, Great Britain has a similar one, which allows you to prosecute your nationals or companies that are nationals in your uh, country, allows you to prosecute them. China has not done a lot of that. And I think you know, this gets back to their whole um, emphasis on sovereignty is that their attitude is if a crime is committed in your country, you prosecute it. I will say in kind of the last gasp of this, this answer, um, I'm not sure China's teaching anyone, anybody in the Belt and Road anything new about corruption. I think a lot of them had schooled themselves quite well uh, on that subject. And I think, you know, is, is always, you put more money into a situation, you get more corruption. And I think that's what Belt and Road has done. Okay, we got two minutes left. So I'll ask you a very short question from Dominic Stevens. Some people say that Xi Jinping is a very rich man. So where does he get his money? Where does he get his wealth? <laughs> um, like Donald Trump, Xi Jinping has never showed me his tax returns. Um, I don't know, is he rich? Is he not rich? Um, how much money did uh, Peng Liyuan make as a singer? She was a major general in the Chinese uh, PLA. I presume she did not have the rights to royalty. I have no idea how much Xi Jinping has, and I have no way of, of ascertaining that. We do know his sister uh, and her husband are quite wealthy. Um, that is a, that, the whole question of that is, is somewhat separate. Um, does Xi Jinping walk around with a big wad of uh, Redmond D in his pocket? I have no idea. I imagine he doesn't. Um, but yeah, the answer to that is, I don't know if he's rich. Um, have him send his, my, have him send me his tax returns. Um, and maybe I'll believe him and maybe I won't. But uh, that's, that's a question that would be very hard for anyone on the outside to answer. I thought that would be the answer. But nonetheless, I thought it was a rather interesting uh, oh, it's, it's a fascinating. It's a fascinating question. I think a lot of Americans would like to know how much money our president has, and we have no clue. Indeed, indeed. But on that cheery note, I'm afraid uh, we have run out of time, and I must apologize to the other eight individuals who still have questions in the Q and A box that have not been addressed. Um, but let us do uh, thank Professor Andrew Waitman for a very, very interesting and stimulating talk with us this evening in our time and in the morning, your time. Thank you, Andrew. I want to thank you, uh, Professor Sang, and all of the, uh, the audience who I can't see, but I know there are quite a few of you at one point. Thank you for uh, zooming in and have a uh, good evening, afternoon, morning, middle of the night, depending on where you are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.